water. Life on Earth cannot exist without it. But too much of it, and it becomes one of the deadliest forces of nature ever known. So we knew that big flood is coming, but we didn't knew that it could be that big. But forecasting, it's going to be something like 500-year event. That was out of, of our possibilities at that time. Throughout human history, floods have taken lives, destroyed towns, cities, and according to the Bible, civilization itself. It was quite striking to see that houses could be buried or torn apart by water. People who were carried away with their houses and are missing. In the summer of 2002, the scenic Vultava River is transformed into a raging torrent that threatens much of the Czech capital city of Prague. The swiftness with which the flood strikes is breathtaking and terrifying. No one knew that it would be to this extent. No one anticipated that. We were vigilant, but we didn't expect a catastrophe like this. While climate change is increasing the risks of floods worldwide, scientists and meteorologists are working tirelessly to develop state-of-the-art technologies that will help stem the tide. We want to develop better tools and models that we can um, put in front of forecasters. If they can do that, then ultimately we can save lives. The longest river of the Czech Republic is the Vltava. It flows through the capital city of Prague. Among the 18 bridges that cross it is the historic Charles Bridge built in the 14th century under King Charles IV, a marvel of medieval engineering. In the early summer of 2002, torrential rains fall upon the Czech capital, but safety measures taken decades earlier have created a false sense of security. We were a little disturbed by the weather in July. There was a lot of low pressure and precipitation. It rained a lot, the ground was soaked. It was obvious that there was going to be a flood. However, all the people in Prague thought that Prague was protected enough by the Voltava Cascade, the barrier that was built in the end of the 80s. On August 6, 2002, a perfect storm descends upon the area. Two low-pressure systems carry warm, moist air up from the Mediterranean, causing a deluge of precipitation over large parts of Central Europe. In the Czech Republic, the Bohemia region is one of the hardest-hit areas. On the 6th, August 6th, uh, there was a first heavy precipitation in, in, in southern Bohemia. So at that time, uh, České Budějovice, which is the town south of, uh, from Prague, were already heavily affected. But it was a uh, limited area that, that was affected by the, the most heavy precipitation. Vltava Reservoir Cascade was able to catch the peak flow at that time. So in Prague, the water rise and, and the discharge uh, reached something like 1,500 cubic meter per second, which is alarming level already, but it caused no significant damage at that time yet. Then there were like two or three days of uh, nice weather where the water was receding lightly receding in Prague, uh, we have to say, because reservoirs were trying to empty as much as space uh, possible. By the morning of August 10th, the storms are gone. The clouds clear and skies are blue once again over Prague. Outdoor crowds bask in the sunshine. They know that additional rain is forecast, but to them, it's just another day. Not a care or a clue of what's yet to come.
The last large flood uh, in Prague occurred in 1890, so it was more than 110 years before uh, uh, 2002, and uh, we forgot what does it mean. And meanwhile, uh, the landscape changed uh, completely. Reservoirs were built, and in the mind of many people, uh, there was a shortage that uh, we have reservoirs and we are safe uh, uh, from the flood impact, which wasn't true. Communication was downright bad. Prague was trying to improve the situation and the management was deliberately taking the situation lightly. We were checking the websites of the Hydro Meteorological Institute to know what the situation actually looks like. But when you are not an expert, you can't make the prognosis based on that. So we knew that the uh, big flood is coming, but we didn't knew that it could be that big. Uh, when we try to compare that to, uh, to the previous events, uh, you know, even hydrologists and meteorologists had at that time mostly comparison to, to minor floods. So, so we knew it would be significant flood, but forecasting it's going to be something like 500-year event. That was out of, of our possibilities at that time. As climate change causes the Earth's atmosphere to become warmer and increasingly moist, Heavy rainfall and catastrophic flooding are occurring with far greater frequency worldwide. Flooding is the world's most common type of natural disaster, accounting for roughly 40% of these events. On average, flooding claims thousands of lives worldwide each year and is responsible for billions of dollars in property damage. To improve the capability of forecasting these extreme natural events, weather agencies from around the globe are developing ever more sophisticated technology. At the United States government's National Severe Storms Lab in Norman, Oklahoma, hydrologist Jonathan Gurley and his team have been working tirelessly to improve the country's response to flash flooding. The ultimate goal here in, in our job is to try to reduce the impacts on our society, both in terms of damage to property and, and most importantly, to reduce casualties caused by flash flooding, which is the number one uh, weather-related killer in the United States. Floods occur across a wide spectrum, ranging from flash floods that are caused by heavy rainfall over a short period of time, usually under six hours to river floods that may occur after days or even weeks of heavy rains. But it's flash floods that are often the most lethal. There are many aspects that make them dangerous. The first one in, in my mind is um, you don't often get the, the visual clues like you get with some other natural hazards. Like um, if we make an analog with tornadoes, um, most people would see a tornado, even a very weak tornado, and they would instantly recognize danger. This is something that could potentially take my life and I need to take cover. But if we look on the low end of a flash flood, we're talking about rainfall. And so this is something that our society actually needs and depends on. Um, and so where does the trigger switch? where we've uh, moved into the realm of being not a beneficial rainfall anymore, but we're producing too much rainfall that's causing a flash flood. You don't often have the, the danger signs that, that people might, might recognize with some of the other natural hazards. Jonathan heads a project called the Flooded Locations and Simulated Hydrographs Project, or FLASH. The project combines real-time rainfall estimates with real-time surface models to provide more accurate information with which to issue flood warnings. Generally, there are some precursor signals um, leading up to a flash flood days in advance. Usually, the, the atmosphere has a lot more moisture integrated um, throughout the depth of the atmosphere, so there, there are some clues leading up to it. Um, the challenge is, is to identify precisely where the storms are going to form and produce the locally heavy rainfall rates. Um, and that's where, um, really, the weather radar is our first line of defense for that. A total of 160 weather radars distributed across the United States send out signals that are received at the Severe Storms Laboratory. The signals indicate the presence of weather patterns as they develop nationwide. 
If you drop extremely heavy rainfall rates on a, on a sandy soil, it may not necessarily be a problem, whereas you can take those same rainfall rates and put them over a city that has a lot of concrete, a lot of impervious surfaces and parking lots and things, and that produces runoff very, very quickly, and, it's, and it becomes much more dangerous. Ultimately, Flash produces hydrologic models that are distributed to weather forecasters nationwide to improve flash flood responses across the country. We want to develop better tools and models that we can um, put in front of forecasters. So these are the people that are really in the hot seat, and we want to provide them better tools, better products, better services, so that the, they can issue more timely flash flood warnings, impact-based flash flood warnings, and they can uh, do their job better. Across the Atlantic, France is a country that has a long history of severe flooding with disastrous consequences. In response, Pierre Javel and his colleagues at the French National Institute for Agriculture, Food and Environment have developed a new flash flood warning system. We are at the foot of what is called a hydrometric station. It is a site equipped to measure water levels of rivers. And from the river levels, we calculate flows. And with those flows, we try to forecast floods. The forecasting system is based on a rainfall runoff hydrological model that is fed with radar gauge rainfall grids. Every 15 minutes, the model estimates the discharges on the river to determine if certain thresholds corresponding to flood levels are likely to be exceeded. You can see here, the water level is about 85 centimeters or so. Normally, the sensor, if properly adjusted, measures this height. And if tomorrow we come back and the level has risen, the sensor should measure exactly the same level as the scale. So, the hydrometric scale is really the focal point here at the station. Altogether, there are some 3,000 stations throughout France all feeding data to a central service that makes the information available to the public. In France, on all the major rivers that cross large urban areas, like here in Aix-en-Provence, this type of sensor is installed precisely to set up flood forecasting services, to be able to warn the population in case of flooding. The stakes are high here, yes. The stakes are also high in Prague, where after a day of sunshine, the rains have returned. As the waters of the Vltava River continue to rise, the all too real chance of a catastrophic flood threatens the life of every living creature in its path. August 11, 2002. Prague in the Czech Republic. After days of sunny skies, another storm slams into the region. Rainfall totals over the past week climbed to 300 millimeters, or close to a foot in some areas. A downpour of this magnitude has not been seen here in decades. The fact is that we were constantly surprised by worsening the situation more than, than the forecast expected, uh, especially when it comes to precipitation. So we forecast heavy precipitation. It always develops uh, to be, uh, I don't know, 50% more, which then adds uh, uh, to, to the worsening situation in the rivers. The water levels of rivers and reservoirs, already swollen from the previous days of rain, rise quickly to historic heights. The ground is now saturated, the runoff grows rapid and massive, and there is no relief in sight. Prediction of numerical weather prediction models that a low pressure will likely move uh, to Central Europe, causing heavy precipitation, uh, in, and likely uh, affecting the same area that was affected just a couple of days before. So that was uh, an alarming signal for us that uh, uh, the flood, really disaster flood, might come. 
The Czech Hydrometeorological Institute, or CHMI, is the governmental institution responsible for monitoring and forecasting the weather and hydrological conditions in the Czech Republic. The role of uh, the Czech Hydrometeorological Institute is to make a very first awareness call uh, to general public and most importantly to, to flood authorities who are responsible for managing floods. On the afternoon of August 11th, the CHMI issues its first flood warning. It's a call to prepare for disaster. The first responders immediately mobilize. Among them, Ludek Prudel, who heads Prague's emergency fire unit. You make preparations for the worst. If you are expecting a catastrophic flood, you activate measures such as flood patrol services. The preparation of bags with sand, building flood protection, or activating special forces. Usually, the flooding begins gradually, so the measures do as well. Under normal circumstances, the CHMI provides a continuous flow of information regarding the storm conditions. But the downpour has been so powerful that many of the data collecting systems have been completely knocked out, making communication sketchy at best. The main problem for us as a forecaster was that we lost a lot of observation. Many stations were destroyed, uh, and uh, those that were well above the water were unfortunately disconnected because using fire lines uh, usually in the flooded area, so, so it stopped work. It was chaos, and, and we experienced what does it mean if you don't have data. For the general public, Trying to gauge the level of danger is near impossible. Peter Valensky, a curator at the Prague Zoo, desperately searches for answers, knowing that the lives of hundreds, if not thousands of animals, hang in the balance. Communication was downright bad. We were checking the websites of the Hydrometeorological Institute to know what the situation actually looked like. But when you are not an expert, you can't make a prognosis based on that. Throughout the day, state television and radio broadcast reports that severe flooding is probable in sections of the city along the Voltava River, a rumor that a flood of proportions not seen in Prague for over 150 years begins circulating. All the while, the CHMI struggles to access data about the impending catastrophe. So we uh, issued warnings, we issued information reports. So for Prague, our expectations uh, were really renewed every three hours after we were able to get some data, uh, somehow process them and try to do new estimates of the development. So, so that was a general warning, but of course, exact forecasting and exact measurement was lacking at that time from many parts of the country. By the evening of August 11th, some 50,000 residents of Prague are ordered to evacuate. Mayor Igor Nemitz calls on all citizens to get into their cars and drive away. Each is allowed to take only a single suitcase of belongings as they flee the city. The mayor also announces that the 14th century Charles Bridge, one of Prague's main tourist attractions, would be closed to the public to allow cranes to remove tree trunks and other debris carried along by the rapidly flowing Voltava River. I stopped on that bridge many times to see the mass of water rushing through Prague. I felt the vibration of the bridge caused by the water, and from my personal experience, I say closing it was the right thing to do. The old bridge could really end badly and collapse. As residents evacuate the city, shop owners work overtime to save their goods. Soldiers, along with hundreds of volunteers, fill bags with sand and build walls to protect the picturesque medieval quarter of Malastrana. The Czech people know full well what is at stake. Torrential rains have already hit neighboring Germany and Austria, 
and floods in Russia have killed dozens of people, bringing the death toll from European storms to more than 70 in a week. Everyone knows that floods were currently happening and certainly believe that all cautions and warnings are based on the truth. And it is a clear reason to leave their homes and head to some safer places. But heading to safer places is not without its risks. The majority of flood-related deaths are caused by people attempting to drive through running water. What happens if you're in your car and you're, you're stuck in a flash flood? Um, first of all, I would say you're in an extremely hazardous situation. And in leading up to that event, it would have been better to have just stayed at home. <laughs> What we find is that victims of flash flooding, it's very unusual to be swept away and killed from a flash flooding in your home. We find that that's actually uh, less than 10% of the cases that that happens, that that occurs. Tragically, many of the vehicular deaths in floods could have been easily avoided. Many flash floods are warned against, and people have some idea that, that, that there is some impending hazard. So if they, if they need to get out and they, they need to um, drive and pick up their children from daycare or whatever the case would be, then my advice would be have a plan B in place. You know, have, have it in mind that you may have to go back home. Most children would rather see a late dad than a dead dad. So have a plan B in place, and then if, if one encounters a flooded roadway, never enter the, the water, no matter what. There are hazards in there that you can't see that may, may be in there. A real winner. I don't know what his problem is. He went through a wash that could have killed him. Now his vehicle stalled out, and he's got, oh my god, he's got kids. I don't believe this. I do not believe this. Jonathan has clear-cut advice for anyone who drives into a flooded area and is trapped in a vehicle filling with water. People are in a panic and they want to get out of that situation and so they, they would open the door. And that's the situation where water's going to move in and rush in very, very quickly. At that point, you're not going to be able to swim and, and force your way out of that. So pr just prior to opening the door, I'd recommend un unlatching your seatbelt, holding on to the steering wheel, opening up that door, let the water rush in, and as it's happening, take a deep breath and then wait for that water to no longer be rushing in, and that's the time you want to swim out. But what happens if you are trapped by rising floodwaters inside your home? Jonathan recommends an entirely different set of strategies. The biggest piece of advice is get to high ground, climb to high ground. That's the thing to do, and that's where some of the people perish, is they're, they may be in a wheelchair or something and they're unable to do that. But, but water um, populates lower areas, so you want to get out of a, a basement. Uh, we've had some situations um, here in the United States where people are sheltering from a tornado and they're underground and, and, and once in a while then those can become flooded. So you have kind of a multi-tiered natural hazard and those can be quite scary. Jonathan believes the safest room in the house during a flood is the attic. He recalls the role that attics played in saving the lives of scores of Americans during one of the country's deadliest weather disasters. In some cases, we've seen extreme situations like in Hurricane Katrina, where people were eventually getting up, having to uh, go up in their attics. Uh, that's because of their homes, the first and even the second stories were being flooded and they had to go into their attics. Um, and there were some uh, situations where they were even becoming trapped in the attics. And so if you lived in an area that might be prone to extreme flooding from, um, from a hurricane, a situation like that, then it would be good to leave something in the attic so that you could break through the roof and get on the roof if you had to, like leave an ax up there. Some way you could break through that because there have been instances where people were trapped in their attic and they couldn't get out. By August 12th, getting out of Prague is on everyone's mind in the Czech capital. But for some, it's easier said than done. Peter Valensky and several colleagues have been trapped at the Prague Zoo since the storms first began, monitoring the situation 
and preparing to evacuate the animals if necessary. We slept in the zoo because most of us, including me, lived on the other side of the river, so we could not get home. So we slept 10, 14 days in the zoo and only took care of the animals, nothing else. We had a very good flood plan. We had flood quotas. The highest of them was 100 years flood. No one knew that it would be to this extent. No one anticipated that. We were vigilant, but we didn't expect a catastrophe like this. After days of torrential rains, the threat of massive flooding hangs over the capital city of Prague in the Czech Republic. On August 13, 2002, those fears are realized as the banks of the Vltava River are breached and floodwaters begin to surge into the low-lying areas of the city. Directly in the path of these waters is the Czech Zoo and its more than 1,200 animals. We had quite a good flood plan. We had flood quotas. The highest of them was 100 years flood, but no one could imagine that it could be even worse. The evacuation plan calls for moving animals from the lower part of the zoo, which would be flooded first, to the upper enclosures. The first animals to be evacuated are the turtles. It is not easy to move turtles, as it may seem. They weigh around 200 kilos, fight you during the process, and the logistics are not really easy. But no sooner had the turtles been moved than the floodwaters toppled the zoo's protective barriers and swept into the facility. At that moment, all the frenetic activity started. We helped to move the felines, and water started to rise. We had water up to our waists. Suddenly, me and my colleagues, we realized that we had moved the turtles, but we left the fruit bats behind. We had to catch fruit bats flying above our heads. Somewhere, higher above, a helicopter was flying with calls for evacuation. It was kind of an apocalyptic situation. The whole world was in twilight, cold, wet, an evacuation call, and we are catching fruit bats and taking them away. The caretakers are in a race against time. By sheer force of will, they succeed in saving hundreds of animals, including a male hippo named Slavik, who miraculously finds his own way to survive the rampaging waters. Walter carried him to the first floor of the hippo pavilion, and he was able to move onto the gallery around the pavilion. After the water receded, he was there, on the gallery, and as it turned out later, completely unharmed. But with the waters rapidly rising, the lower part of the zoo becomes submerged and tragedy soon follows. Dozens of birds are lost when floodwaters completely fill their cage and a heartbreaking decision must be made with a bull elephant named Kadir. Some elephant males can be very dangerous, and this one was the case. It had its enclosure from which he could not be evacuated. So he was shot the moment the water rose, so high that it was obvious he would have drowned. Meanwhile, over in the Gorilla Pavilion, the waters are also rising. The exhibit sits in the flood zone, but features a built-in escape route for the animals. In case the water flows into the Gorilla Pavilion, it is designed with an anti-flood tower. The gorillas were taught to go to this tower, where they would be relatively safe. As planned, 
The gorilla family climbs the tower and are rescued, but a young pubescent male remains in the bottom area and perishes. We learned our lesson. So when there was a smaller flood in 2013, we moved, without thinking, every animal from this zone, and we didn't lose a single animal. And then there is the sea lion named Gaston, who is carried by the floodwaters clear out of the zoo and into the Voltava River. I read the newspaper headlines. Sea lion frees himself and swims to North Sea. He is finally free. Finally, he can swim. But nothing could be further from the truth. Animals in the zoo have their environment, and we try to make them as comfortable as possible. These animals were born here, and they can't live outside of the zoo. We tracked him into the Voltava, somewhere around Usti nad Labem. We tried to feed him and catch him. It was not possible. The water took him to Germany somewhere around Dresden. We arranged a vehicle, but as it turned out, he was so stressed he didn't make it. So, if the media wrote stories about a sea lion finally being free, the real situation was that the completely stressed out animal, bombarded by objects in the water, blinded by muddy water, succumbed to stress in that water. So, when we read that the sea lion was finally free, we were very sorry. Through the Herculean efforts of the zoo's caretakers, more than 1,100 animals are saved. But the loss of 100 animals and their habitat is tragic. This 2002 was a catastrophe. You can imagine what a catastrophe looks like. When the water receded, we saw the terrible devastation. And in fact, that was the most difficult moment. Not just the dead animals, but the whole devastation was unimaginable. Elsewhere in Prague, the city is a true disaster zone. The floodwater has breached the defenses in several low-lying areas, and with no other serious protection, quickly flows through entire districts. Anyone chancing the streets in these flooded areas needs a rowboat. At the same time, the metro anti-flood system has failed, and 29 stations are now underwater. Of course, the situation was evaluated and the operation in the subway was stopped. Fortunately, there were no people in the subway at the time of the flooding. The material damage during the flood was huge because in the Czech Republic alone, it reached the value of some 73 to 74 billion crowns. Despite the tremendous losses, the measures taken to protect the historic Charles Bridge proved successful and prevent it from sustaining permanent damage. And thanks to Prague's advanced warning systems, most citizens evacuate the city prior to the flood's arrival resulting in a minimal loss of life. In 2002, the number of fatalities was uh, between 15 or 17. It depends uh, who count uh, to be a victim of the flood. And most of them were related to uh, heart attacks uh, during uh, the rescue situation. So a very good sign of the ability to learn from the previous situation. The insight gained from previous situations is at the heart of efforts to prevent catastrophic flooding from reoccurring. Today, throughout the Czech Republic, scientists and first responders are learning from the past in planning for the future.
A great catastrophe is always a huge lesson. This means that everyone, including the fire emergency unit, will learn from the disaster, and we have optimized the equipment. Of course, we have improved the activity of operation centers. What we are trying to do is uh, not to do the revolution, but, but uh, uh, provide continuous evolution of tools and, and, and methods that we use. So it's continuous work on developing the, the hydrological models as well as meteorological models. If you look at the model today, it's something completely different than it was 18 years ago in 2002. So we are trying to, to move uh, steadily in, in enhancing our model step by step. Uh, what uh, we are looking at is really uh, the techno uh, technology and also more and more uh, trying to uh, get involved in those social science impacts and connections to uh, other problems uh, of risk uh, and forecasting because it's not only about producing information from the hydrological point of view, but providing information for the people uh, to react based on that and, and they make their decision. We are trying to uh, work on both, on technology as well as uh, the social impacts and social consequences of, uh, of our forecasting service. Some of the most significant failures in 2002 were the communication problems and lack of data arriving from the flood zones due to equipment malfunctions. That problem is being addressed today through advances in technology. What was a big, huge difference was the change of communication from solid uh, lines, uh, telephone lines, uh, to cell phone technologies and uh, of course uh, also radar technology and uh, also uh, the information from satellites uh, develops significantly and bringing us more and more data that we can build on when uh, trying to do our decisions. The number of observation points providing real-time data increased uh, four times and we also changed the technology so instead of having data once in an hour uh, based on dial-up uh, we have every 10 minutes a new set of data available. The Czech Republic is just one of many countries where time and resources are being allocated to combat catastrophic flooding. Throughout the world, meteorologists, social scientists and psychiatrists are working together to create new systems and technologies to ensure less damage and greater chances of surviving these most deadly of natural disasters. Today, as scientists and engineers develop increasingly sophisticated technology to predict floods and protect the public from their onslaught, the stakes are higher than ever. In France, one quarter of all residents, one third of all jobs, and 3.7 million homes are now potentially exposed to these deadly disasters. Flooding represents the country's main major national risk in terms of the number of municipalities affected and the resulting costs. It's not something that people think about every day. Maybe we're going to get flooded today. But when you get to the field in general, it's completely devastated. Broken houses, children's rooms on the ground, rubble everywhere, and a very striking silence. There's nobody left except nature. In developing effective systems for forecasting catastrophic floods, Scientists must take into account the specific weather patterns and geography of the affected regions. The south of France, for instance, and its unique position along the Mediterranean Sea, makes it especially vulnerable to heavy rains and flooding.
La période. The period of rain here in our region is autumn. We have a very hot August and a very hot September. So the water of the Mediterranean remains quite warm, sometimes for a long time, even until October. This year we still had 20 degrees Celsius until the beginning of October. And then as soon as it cools down, the phenomenon is called cold drop, which creates an evaporation, followed by these rains. The showers can be torrential, dropping as much as 300 millimeters or 12 inches of rain in a 24-hour period. We have quite intense rainfall for a duration. These rains that come up from the Mediterranean and that will affect the whole coastline. Cumulative rain that makes the sea go up, upwelling as we call it. We're going to look at a map on an internet with some kind of weather satellite to see where it falls and how much will fall. We know, for example, that if 100 millimetres of water falls in Bon Le Mimosa or Le Lavendu, we know that it will overflow anyway. We know that in Hier, the Garpo, if it rains, for example, a little higher, will have quantities like 80 to 100 millimetres. We know that there would be a very good chance of the Garpo reacting very quickly. These are problematic areas. In the district of Oratoire, in Hier, they have the Garpo right to them and the technical services of the city of Hier at each orange alert set up this SMS system to warn all the inhabitants. Be careful, we're on orange alert. They regularly watch the rise of the Garpo and they even prepare an advance means to evacuate people. And that is new. I feel like it's something that works better than before to avoid people being surprised in the middle of the night. In recent years, French scientists have partnered with Jonathan Gurley and his team at the National Severe Storms Laboratory. They have worked hand in hand in developing software and models to assist them in forecasting deadly floods and reducing their impact. They have ambitions that are very similar to ours in terms of producing uh, models that run at a very high cadence, meaning uh, sub-hourly or every 10 minutes across the country of France, very similar to what we do here in the United States. So the first thing we did with them is we opened a dialogue where we hosted a mini workshop here in Oklahoma where they came and we spent several days uh, just um, having a dialogue, showing what we're doing. They demonstrated what they're doing and that was a very nice way to begin. Uh, since then, I visited their laboratory and so we ran our models side by side to learn from them, to determine uh, did our models have particular strengths under in certain situations and how did theirs do. We're, we're learning together and it's been rewarding that we're, uh, we have the same goals, same, same ambitions and we're working together to uh, achieve those goals. Jonathan and his team have also been working with forecasters from the National Weather Service. Over the past five years, the forecasters have been invited to the Severe Storms Laboratory for the so-called testbed experiments, where they have an opportunity to try out new flood detection technology in a simulated environment. The forecasters go and they, they give us feedbacks about what worked and most importantly, what didn't work. And so that feedback we found over the course of years has been valuable for us to go back and to refine the tools um, that we ultimately transition to operations. And I think that the tools that we've been developing as a global community can now be used to better identify when you know, a particular city, um, businesses are, are gonna be inundated by, uh, by a river flood. One of the most innovative new tools being used to forecast floods is the stream flow radar. This remote sensing technology has been especially helpful in addressing the increased wildfires and flooding due to climate change. Unlike more conventional string radar, the stream radar sensors are installed above streams to prevent them from being destroyed by potentially raging floodwaters. What the stream radars are, it's actually two radars. One of them's pointing straight down to the water, another one's pointing off at an angle. And then with these two radars, we can measure the velocity of the surface of the water and then also the rate of rise of the, of the water. 
And so this information is, is really useful whenever we're studying the science of the transformation of heavy rainfall to runoff in streams. Um, they're also used for early alerting to notify some of the local uh, constituents and even myself that, uh, that rates are being exceeded and, and people need to, need to be aware and take cover. As scientists continue developing systems to protect the public from floods, they are becoming increasingly dependent upon machine learning and artificial intelligence to supplement their physics-based prediction models. In our case, the hydrologic models that underlie the flash modeling system are physics-based models. So they are, they're representing um, the, the world, the, the physics-based world as much as we can. Nowadays, we have very large data sets, so we have millions and millions and millions of grid points of forecast of flash flooding. Uh, you know, it's a repeat offender. It always floods in that particular point. In some of these areas, we don't necessarily understand why, but that's where the machine learning and AI come into play, and then they'll, they'll identify these regions because they've been his, historically um, repeat offenders, so to speak, of producing flash floods. That's how we incorporate um, a machine learning. It's almost a post-processor, if you will, from the physics-based model forecasts of flash flooding that we have. When flooding is imminent, authorities strive to give the public as much advanced warning as possible. By increasing the lead time, they will ultimately save lives and reduce property damage. So this is our most important role, to, to give you, to provide a lead time of a couple of hours, maybe one day uh, ahead to be prepared. What we are trying to do is uh, not to do the revolution, but, but uh, uh, provide continuous evolution of tools and, and, and methods that we use. We want to continue to improve our software. We want to uh, couple it with uh, atmospheric prediction models so that we can increase lead time and continue to push that envelope. At the same time, weather experts have not lost sight of the human element that must also be taken into account in developing systems and strategies for surviving the ravages of flood water. When it comes to trying to reduce um, the impacts and fatalities from flash flooding, we really must um, incorporate social scientists into this research and believe that we can take a quantum leap and start understanding behaviors and why some of the people take some of the risks that they do to drive through flooded roadways, for instance, when they could simply um, stop. And the slogan that we use in NOAA is, uh, is to turn around, don't drown. The presence of mental health workers at flood disaster sites has also proven incredibly beneficial to those who have survived these catastrophic events. Usually they see white gowns coming forward and they're happy because they see that we're there for them too. They often come to talk to us about what they've been through, how they've experienced the situation, the fears they may have felt, what happened afterwards, and then there are also questions about what will happen to them next. It scared me terribly. I was really panicked. I've never seen this in my life and it's, how to say, shocking. It's really shocking. We are traumatized. What happened today is too traumatizing for everyone. It's too much and there's nothing to be done. The people you meet after a flood are usually in a state of shock, especially if you arrive at the scene very early, since they've often been confronted with their own death at the time. In many cases, Flood survivors exhibit a coping mechanism known as disassociation. Dissociation is a psychological manifestation of anxiety. 
The brain temporarily disconnects for anxiety reasons. The shock is so great that the mind cannot manage this stress. This anxiety overload is too heavy on the person, and the mind's protection reflex is to disconnect, to temporarily disassociate the emotions from reality. These people need to be taken care of quickly, because you can see that they're disconnected from reality, so they don't realize what's going on around them. We're trying to help people get home, many elderly people. Not too long ago, we delivered food to an elderly person because they are completely blocked. There are places we can't even go because the water is higher than 1.2 to 1.5 meters. By understanding human behavior, as well as the science behind flooding, weather experts believe we are finally making headway in learning to survive this most deadly natural disaster. As water flows, it's, uh, it's incredible phenomena. And of course, water impacts us in, in many aspects through drought, uh, through uh, sanitation, and through floods. During the forecast, it's always our aim to, to try to be useful and provide information that uh, would then uh, help someone else to be protected, to be more safe. And uh, for us, the good forecast brings us satisfaction in our life.